everyone, and it's an honor and a privilege to moderate this most exciting panel. It's where the rubber hits the road, I think. So, very briefly, I'm going to do, at least attempt to do what Margaret was asked to do, and briefly give you a quick run-up about the importance of data disaggregation, some, some, some thoughts um, that came into my mind when I was calling me this morning from Brighton. <laughs> so in, they may be inchoate, incoherent, but and do forgive me in advance. Uh, and then I will introduce my esteemed panel. Data are the lifeblood of policy and the raw material for accountability. So says this wonderful UN handbook called A World That Counts. Data disaggregation is key. I work with data all the time. And so I completely understand how important it is and how absolutely frustrating it is to also collect data. The world has made huge strides in data collection in the recent years and tracking specific indicators for human development. However, there are very many disturbing gaps. There are entire groups of people where, who, are, who are not part of the data collection exercise. Key issues and key groups remain invisible. Take, for example, violence. Violence against children is mostly undercounted. Violence against women, violence against LGBTI people are often underreported. And that leads to failures in protecting these very, very vulnerable groups. And so it is with religious minorities as well. I come across a study on wash facilities where there's data collected, aggregate data collected on national levels of access to uh, toilets and so on and so forth. But they don't drill down. This is in my native India. They often don't drill down to the village or the panchayat level where you don't know, is it religion, is it caste? What restricts people from accessing wash data? So this is very important for uh, for, for this is a very key issue in why religion, uh, data disaggregation or disaggregated data is so important. Um, I, I want very briefly, I won't, I won't go into this because I have here three marvelous experts to talk to you, but to tell you a little bit about why data disaggregation is such a terrifying topic, and I am ever so glad I'm not there and I'm just <laughs> moderating. Disaggregated data, everybody needs it, it's important, it's vital, the right data, high quality data, is important for the right for, for the right policy uh, to, to create the right policy. But it's also um, it's it's fraught with many problems. One of the problems is it could fall into the wrong hands. For example, uh, data on religious minorities. If the one particular government in uh, collected the whole, it was the host government. It collected data on religious minorities, which it then used against them. Uh, disaggregated data, uh, particularly at the individual level, can increase tensions in contexts where, uh, for example, there are already frictions. Take, for example, in Burma, uh, when there was a particular focus on the Muslim Rohingya, uh, because data was collected, I see, uh, ben Rogers nodding, he of course is the CSW expert in this area. Uh, when, when data was collected for this particular religious minority, the needy Buddhists were upset. So it's not an easy subject. Again, I'm delighted I'm not there and I'm here. Uh, disaggregated data is, is, is troubling and worrying on some levels because it may discourage self-identification due to stigma and discrimination uh, that's associated with your identity. For example, Yazidis might not wish, would, might, may not, many of Yazidis do not wish to disclose in, uh, in camps, in humanitarian camps, that they were Yazidi. So these, these are problems with data, but there are tremendous advantages for di disaggregated data. I disaggregate data when I collect it, and I'm hauled routinely before my uh, IRB board to explain myself, and uh, I attempt to, and I probably do a good job because they give me the uh, go-ahead to collect more data. But uh, I'm sure the day is coming when they will disagree with what I'm doing and I shall be stopped. 
Um, the, the advantages are, and, and where this data can be collected is when religious groups are easily identified, where this is not, where they are able to show that they are religious minorities. For example, if you walk into a village, someone talked about Western uh, part of Northern Nigeria. When I went in there to do some work, there was nobody who was willing to talk. I was able to talk to the Imam, and it's not a religious issue, it's more the way in which the society is structured. The Imam was able to tell me why people were not uh, were, were worried about polio uh, immunization. The Imam was able to tell me a little bit about education. It's the way the society is structured, where people are able to easily identify themselves, where there's a bold personal confession, uh, and when uh, Persecution, and this is not often the case, but in the cases where persecution is minimal. I'm going to comment or try to comment if I make it through in my seven minutes on four topics. One is thinking a bit about what development means uh, now in 2021. Uh, secondly, some specific uh, data challenges. Uh, third, to focus on what we call mapping and the significance and uh, some of the challenges that are involved. And then four, look at some very specific topics within work on development and the links with data. Uh, let me preface this with a, with a brief comment that I have um, an unusual experience now of roughly 20 years of working on the bridges between religion and development. As I describe it, I was drafted by Jim Wolfenson and George Carey when he was Archbishop of Canterbury to work on this topic without, frankly, any real expertise or earlier experience. So what I have is roughly um, a few decades, let's not get specific on that, plus 20 years. Um, but, but the first period when I really was not in any way related to the religion issue, but focused on development, followed by the 20 years, which does lead to a lot of reflection. Um, I ask myself, what did we miss in Rwanda in the 70s and the 80s? What did we not see? What about DRC? What about some of the other countries, all of which I was Kenya? I was intensely involved in uh, during a period when there was really no explicit focus whatsoever. Uh, on religious issues then followed by that. So there are some that are quite specific. Um, for example, uh, I think those of us who worked on the Sahel are deeply conscious of what we missed, what we did not see uh, in the 90s, for example. The, um, the changes in the nature of, uh, of Islam, what was happening there. Uh, there's fascinating work uh, on northern Nigeria, Niger, some of the other countries uh, by Alex Thurston, uh, which really focuses on where did people study uh, and what the patterns were of where uh, scholars were, were going overseas and the, the ways in which that helped to shape their ideas. So this issue of looking back as well as looking forward, I think, is, uh, is immensely important and is, is part of the, of the lesson. So first of all, on development, the word development now is a very tough tough one to, to, uh, to define, uh, because it's everything. Uh, we now have, of course, the SDG, the Sustainable Development Framework, with 17 goals and 169 targets, but it applies to all countries. Uh, it's not, the World Bank, I know, tried. I, Michael, I don't know whether it's been successful in banning the term developing countries, uh, because it has no real meaning anymore, uh, developing countries. But what it means also is that the issues, you know, the five P's in the um, Sustainable Development Goals, which are uh, people, uh, planet, peace, prosperity, and partnerships, uh, bring the issues of climate change very much into focus. And one area which I feel is deeply neglected uh, is the focus on fragile states uh, and um, the need for us to look in much more depth at the relationship of some of the religious trends uh, within, the, uh, within the fragile states, which is, of course, the sort of central problem, in a sense, uh, for development uh, these days. So the point is that development is very broad, huge number of organizations, which seem to multiply. Uh, for those of you who've seen Fantasia, 
uh, you know, the splitting of the brooms. There's so many organizations mm -hmm. now uh, that um, public, private, uh, civil society, etc., uh, that trying to sort of characterize them uh, is very difficult. So uh, I think when we talk about development, we need to be quite conscious of the breadth of what it is uh, that we're looking at. Um, part of my experience came, as I said, with this early exposure uh, to in 1999, in other words, pre-9-11, which is important, because 9-11 and the, the whole set of movements has changed the nature of the ways in which religion and, and public policy in general uh, have been looked at. Uh, but we had a, a shock that we did not expect from the perspective of the World Bank that when this dialogue process, I'm saying dialogue, no money involved, was launched, essentially all hell broke loose. Uh, and Jim Wolfenson, the president at the time, was proud of saying there were 184 countries to zero in favor of engaging with religion. So the first year I spent in trying to understand why that was. And I have a whole separate uh, sort of spiel on that, but basically it amounted to three Ds and an E. So the first D was that religion is divisive, i.e. political, that it's about power, uh, it's about seeking followers. Uh, the second is that religion is dangerous um, because it opposes religion, which of course is a nonsense as a whole, but this was the perception. It opposes fundamental issues of of equality uh, that the development world um, favors, uh, and uh, that the power issues are what is under underneath. Uh, and the third is that it's essentially defunct uh, and therefore not a, not a priority, therefore does not belong on the priority list. And the E I use to describe emotional. Uh, I am old enough that I was in the early days of women being part of development discussions and gender. And I know that for a long time, people giggled and laughed. Um, they approached gender issues, not with their minds, but with their emotions as to relationships between men and women. And it's been astonishing to see a similar approach with religion, where uh, people tend to say, have a very strong view of religion, uh, which is not necessarily driven by knowledge, which has led us to the issues of religious literacy. That's what I was afraid of, you see. But let me touch very briefly on the couple. You're timing yourself. That's marvelous. I was trying to, but it's, it won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that basically, but, but essentially, I, I think that I will um, simply rest on what Rebecca and the earlier panelists said on the importance of data uh, and the gaps in data, the poor data. Uh, data on religion is worse than any other uh, feature. So, And it, it's dominated by a couple of, of questions and issues that, that come up all the time. The, clearly, we, we're all of us using all the time a Pew figure, which was that 84% of the world's population has some religious affiliation. But then you have to say, what does that actually mean? Uh, some of the more meaningful issues issues are around the trust of religious leaders compared with other, other groups, uh, but also religiosity. In other words, you know, Senegal has very high religiosity. What do you do with that? What do you do except hope that somebody will be asking questions? Um, quickly on mapping, this is something that we focus on. Uh, we are absolutely convinced that until you come to the country level, uh, it's very difficult to have uh, robust uh, and effective discussions, uh, and therefore we do country uh, studies where we're trying to bring together what is the development agenda, what is the religion agenda, where is religion involved. Uh, there are a lot of hiccups in this, one of which is that what we've been doing so far is simply trying to develop the kinds of, of products, the kinds of documents that will be useful, but there's no mechanism, there's not been any support for trying to keep that as a living, continuing uh, exercise. And finally, on the issue of what are the areas I do want to point to about four
four areas. The first is that there really needs to be a serious focus on the religious dimensions, including with data, uh, in country strategic work. So that is a first one. A second obvious area is in project design, which is location specific in many cases. Um, a third uh, is on developing early warning systems for genocide and so forth. Uh, and um, there was an interesting discussion in the World Bank focused on the safeguard policies, which are the, the areas that people are required to look at. Uh, and one of the questions was whether a religious freedom dimension could be included in that. And I think that discussion uh, is one that's worth picking up, but one which went nowhere at the time because it was simply too complex. Okay. 135 billion people are assessed as, as being in need of protection and assistance, of whom 65 million are displaced, of whom 25 million are displaced externally, so they're, so they're refugees. But it's that bigger number um, that we're looking at in a system which is um, worth about $25 billion a year. So it's quite a big uh, business. M my part of that system is to try and, try and coordinate or herd the cats on protection um, within, within the humanitarian system. And protection is worth about $1.2 billion uh, a year. Um, we work in 30 operations, um, the, the most uh, uh, high profile ones as you as you can imagine as well as some smaller ones that can do us our Salvador chip get the attention that they, they deserve and um, while we need in 30 operations we have about 900 partners including faith-based organizations um, working in, in, in our operations there protection has a very broad definition it includes respect um, for rights under refugee law, human rights law, and international humanitarian law. Very briefly on the refugee side, of course, um, we collect data about the religious affiliation of refugees where it's relevant, because uh, religion is a protected ground under the Convention relating to the status of refugees of 1951, where people raise a claim of religious persecution, then of course we collect, collect that data. We also collect information to support what we call refugee status determination, either by the refugee agency itself or by, by member states of, of, of the UN. And we have offices and places, for example, in Chin State in Myanmar, which are simply present in order to gather information in Chin State about the persecution of Christians in, in, in Myanmar and for no other operational um, and also, um, apart from refugee status determination, we, we register refugees. Registration is in itself a protection activity. But where we have data on refugees, we don't necessarily publish that information because it can be destabilizing. Um, if, if we publish data on the religious affiliation of refugees in Lebanon, for example, that the, the number of refugees in Lebanon is already a destabilizing factor publicizing their religious affiliation would, would create further uh, destabilization and, and we're very cautious about the use of, of information about religious affiliation. On the non-refugee side, on, on the in-country operations, um, we are perhaps overly cautious about collecting data but certainly about, about publishing it. We have principled reasons for caution about collecting data on religious affiliation that includes our humanitarian principles of neutrality uh, and humanity and do no harm. Um, but we also have um, principled caution because of the principles of non-discrimination, both in human rights law and in, and in um, humanitarian law. But of course we collect information about the communities where we're working, because without that information, we don't know who we're working with, we don't know what their needs are, and where we are. So, of course, we collect that information, but it's not necessarily an individual or a household level of data collection. 
and the information will come from other sources, <coughs> logical studies, from political information, or, or civil affairs. Um, apart from the collection of, of the information that we do, um, there's the analysis of the information, and that isn't particularly good. So, for example, in, in, in Iraq, at the height of um, the post Mara um, situation, we had 19 uh, data collection exercises going on at any given time. 19, in, in order, um, including information about education certificates being used in one part of Iraq rather than another, um, a really quite um, granular level of, of information being, being sought. But very little of it was analysed. What does that mean? What does it mean for, for the protection of people? I'm glad to say that the analysis of information is getting better, and it's something that we've focused on uh, quite a lot over the past few years. And the principal reason um, that we collect information and, and analyse it is for the Humanitarian Needs Overview and the response plans, so that donors know what it is that they should be looking at in terms of assistance to countries and where they should be focusing. There's also a higher level reason for collecting information um, about uh, protection risks because the Interagency Standing Committee has adopted a policy on protection mm -hmm. which commits the entire humanitarian system to the reduction of risk. And of course, um, where religious minorities are at risk is the responsibility of the entire system to help reduce that risk. So we need to understand it and therefore we collect uh, the information. At the individual level, um, we have a further caution about, about collecting information about someone's religious affiliation. The, protection, the handbook on the protection of IDPs, which is now about 10 years old, um, has a, a no registration default. We don't register IDPs. And the reason for that is that IDPs are citizens, so internally displaced persons are citizens within their own country, and these are sovereign states. You cannot collect information about citizens in a sovereign state without that state either being party to the collection or having a right to know what, what information you're collecting. Um, and uh, information which on the face of it can be neutral, uh, for example about return intentions, can also be used in order to gauge political affiliation, as we found uh, quite strongly in, in Yemen, for example. So, uh, if we're collecting information about uh, IDPs, there has to be a purpose to it, and the purpose is usually to give assistance, and religious affiliation isn't necessarily uh, needed in order to determine what kind of assistance that, that people are, are, are receiving. Um, we've also tried to improve our of processes by adopting some of the data policy standards which um, are now common uh, within governments and, and the EU. Um, but um, to, uh, I just want to say something about Catherine's point about uh, assessment and the other point about action. Um, we, uh, for example, collected information about people's potential concerns in South Sudan uh, at the time of the independence, when I was there, and I was up in, in Jongle State, mm -hmm. uh, in a remote area, asking for what their number one uh, physical protection issue was. And I thought it would be bombing by, by Antonovs from the north. And people said, no, it was um, uh, we are lions. People who transformed themselves into lions in order to attack them. But this was a number one concern that came out. And it was a, it was a spiritual concern. But as a humanitarian agency, there was nothing we could do with that information. It was of no practical use to us. We couldn't program for it, and we had to delete it. Uh, and we substituted our own, um, our own observations, essentially, for what the, the needs of the people were. So this link between what we, information we get and the action that we take is, is also very important. And finally, I just want to mention very briefly, because nobody has mentioned it today, we have the humanitarian sphere of action, we have the development sphere of action. In the humanitarian sphere, uh, we have our, our principles and our human rights standards, uh, the centrality of protection of humanitarian action. On the development side, we're not as strong. And the Secretary General, um, in his development system reforms, and the published paper does not mention human rights one single time. And I think that's very concerning. 
um, that in a, in a development action sphere, we don't talk about the, the rights of people, including the right, obviously, to, to religious freedom. As we talk uh, today about the relationship between religion, uh, humanitarian crisis, and development, the relationship between religious exclusion, uh, and uh, better policy to address religious exclusion and uh, uh, developmental deficits, I'm haunted by a story. Uh, the story uh, takes place uh, in June of 1939. Uh, and it's actually a story that revolves around the date June 6th, 1939. Uh, we've all been spending time talking about another June 6th anniversary, namely the 75th anniversary of the Normandy invasion, uh, June 6th, 1944. This is an anniversary that's the 80th anniversary of this tragic journey, a journey of a ship, the MS uh, San Luis. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, this uh, ship. Uh, this uh, ship carried 937 passengers, men, women, and children uh, from Europe. Uh, their, uh, their destination was originally Cuba. Uh, these people had purchased visas uh, to go to Cuba. Uh, but when they arrived in Cuba, they were refused. Uh, Cuba had changed its mind about whether they were welcome. Uh, they then tried to go to the United States. Uh, and uh, they were told they were not welcome there uh, either. Uh, they were told that they needed to get in line uh, and apply through the normal uh, visa uh, process. Uh, it so happened that these men, women, and children were Jews. Uh, they were fleeing uh, Europe, uh, Europe increasingly overrun uh, with uh, vicious hostility against Jews. The year before, 1938 has seen Kristallnacht uh, the vicious attack on Jewish shops and businesses uh, and synagogues, uh, and an increasing number of Jews uh, were be beginning to flee uh, Europe. But what these Jews were told was that the United States immigration process was religion blind, uh, that uh, it could not take issues of creed uh, into account, uh, and they were told that they should get in line and uh, apply uh, for the meager 27,000 spots uh, that were available to any Germans or Austrians that wanted to come to the United States. Uh, I applaud uh, Creed uh, and its mission uh, in no small part because it seems to me that we still live in a world uh, where many, many people are being discriminated against on the basis of Creed, and yet too many of us, too much of the time, uh, respond by saying, well, we shouldn't take Creed into account uh, because uh, we simply have to look at need uh, and uh, not Creed. And I'm haunted uh, by the worry uh, that too many of our governments, too many of our policymakers uh, are blind uh, to the realities that so much need is in fact driven uh, by creed, by discrimination uh, on the basis of creed uh, that is at least as widespread uh, in 2019 as it was 80 years ago in 1939. In fact, uh, we don't now have just a few uh, Nazi-like regimes in the world, uh, we have a growing number, I would say of governments that openly discriminate on the basis of religion and religious belief uh, in part. According uh, to uh, the political scientist Jonathan Fox, uh, there are 146 countries in the world. Uh, that's more than 80% of the world's countries uh, that engage uh, in some form of serious discriminatory activity against religious minorities, 146 countries. Uh, that figure has grown uh, uh, since 1990, when there were 136 uh, countries with governments that discriminated, uh, discriminated against religious minorities. That's just governmental uh, discrimination. Uh, if you take into account social restrictions and discrimination, uh, there are some 30% of the world's countries in which there are severe levels of discrimination by private, uh, that is non-governmental actors against uh, people on the basis of religion. Uh, and it's no exaggeration uh, to say that we do see a growing number of countries uh, that have uh, viciously, uh, narrowly nationalist ideologies. Uh, the Pew Research Center estimates that 10% of countries in the world uh, now have governments or influential politicians 
that are influenced by a narrowly nationalist ideology that discriminates against religious minorities. Uh, the United States is one such country. Uh, Western Europe has now many governments uh, which have nationalist governments that openly discriminate against religious minorities. Other countries uh, of this description are Burma, India, Sri Lanka, uh, New Zealand, the Philippines, Nepal, uh, and then many, uh, as I said, European countries, Austria, Bulgaria, Denmark, Estonia, Finland. In many, many of these cases, the minority group that's being singled out for vicious discrimination and persecution is Muslims. Uh, and in many, many countries, Burma, of course, has seen genocidal level assaults on Muslim uh, Rohingya. India is seeing openly vicious and violent attacks on its 140 million member Muslim minority. Sri Lanka has seen rising attacks on Muslims uh, since the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War in 2009. And it's arguable that uh, in many, many countries, thank you, it's arguable that in many, many countries, uh, Muslims uh, are the Jews uh, of uh, today in the levels of attacks, violence, persecution, uh, and discrimination. And there are many reasons to believe that this religious discrimination we see is intertwined with development outcomes. Uh, being a member of an unfavored religious minority makes people more vulnerable to sexual crimes and enslavement. Uh, the Arise Foundation recently put out a, a disturbing report about the targeting of Christians and Pakistan Christian women uh, for trafficking and uh, sexual enslavement. Uh, uh, we uh, see that uh, discrimination of individuals on the basis of religion can undermine their economic outcomes. Uh, my wife, Rebecca, just recently learned about a group of Muslims uh, in uh, Sri Lanka uh, who had made, uh, made it all the way through a process of getting recognized as a company providing electricity, but then were denied at the last uh, level simply because of their religious uh, identity. Uh, we, we see discrimination of organizations on the basis of religion in ways that undermine the delivery of, uh, of faith-based social services. Compassion International, one of the largest faith-based development organizations in the world, uh, lost its access to India, uh, closing down its child sponsorship program, one of the world's most successful child sponsorship programs. 160,000 sponsored children in India lost access to their child sponsorship, uh, and this was largely because of religious discrimination. We see religion-related development disparities causing massive conflict, which in turn uh, undermines development outcomes. We saw this in the Central African Republic. We saw this in Orissa uh, in the time of uh, uh, the Kandamal violence uh, in uh, Orissa uh, about 10 years ago, uh, in which uh, conflict between Hindu uh, Khandas uh, and predominantly Christian Khandas, uh, conflict that was uh, in part because of development disparities led to horrific religious violence, which then created a, a refugee crisis uh, and undermined development outcomes uh, for this region of India. So it's clear we must do much more data analysis and collection uh, of uh, the uh, issues of religious exclusion, religious discrimination, religious identity, uh, and how those affect development outcomes. Fortunately, we already have a model, uh, I'll finish soon. Fortunately, we already have a model in the collection of this kind of data, including in its relationship to development, and that is uh, in uh, what is called the Demographic and Health Survey Program, funded, and I know this is something that Catherine Marshall is familiar with, funded largely by the U.S. Agency for International Development. For many, many years now, USAID has been funding surveys uh, in some 90 countries uh, on a whole host of issues concerning the relationship between uh, a variety of, of, of issues and development. Uh, they look at issues of uh, fertility, education, uh, access to immunization, uh, understanding of the causes of diseases like malaria. Uh, and uh, guess what? One of the issues is that the DHS surveys ask about religion. Uh, they consistently ask respondents, and these are large N surveys, in some cases 10,000 size samples, in some cases larger, uh, and because of such large samples, they actually, actually compete in terms of reliability with uh, national censuses. Uh, so if a country doesn't ask for their religion in a census, you can actually get a good sense of the religious composition of that country by going to a DHS survey. The DHS survey in Vietnam in 2005, for example, gives a good sense of the religious composition of Vietnam, just as if it's so large, and because it asks about religion. We already know from 
DHS surveys that there are very interesting relationships between religion and things like fertility. Uh, even things like uh, uh, the understanding of the causes of malaria are correlated in interesting cases with religious identity. Uh, so we can build on what DHS is already doing. And my I'm wife. Take uh, the privilege of the chair and uh, put your mic off. <laughs> <laughs> well, this just it, 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 one, one more minute. I'll just say, uh, and I was gonna, I was about to compliment you, so I don't, don't want to cut you off. Now. Uh, but this is building on the model of the demographic health survey. Survey. My wife is collecting data on uh, issues of religion, religious freedom, and development outcomes in India and Sri Lanka with samples that exceed uh, ten thousand. Uh, and th those uh, uh, studies uh, already show interesting relationships between uh, religious identity, religious behavior, uh, and development outcomes. They also show, by the way, uh, levels of concern about religious persecution and exclusion. My wife's data shows, for example, that Muslims are the group in India that uh, by far uh, feels the most uh, vulnerable to persecution. This is already before the election, the recent uh, BJP victories, sweeping victories last month in Indian elections. Uh, I'll say only one more thing, and that is our institute uh, funded, I'm sorry Margaret Daly's not here because I was going to thank her, uh, funded in part uh, with funds uh, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, is trying to expand further uh, the study of uh, how much people feel that they're being discriminated against socially, uh, in terms of employment, in terms of access to the to private sector and public sector employment, based on their religion. We need more studies of that sort uh, in order to further the disaggregation uh, of data in this area by 